I'm not feeling all right today. I'm not feeling that great. I'm not catching on fire today. Love has started to fade. I'm not going to smile today. I'm not going to laugh. You're out living it up today. I've got blues to pay. And the bay of vigor fits on the forceps. The phone mason does all the work. The barber can give you a haircut. The carpenter can take you out to lunch. Now, but I just want to play on my handpipes. I just want to drink me some wine. As soon as you're born, you start dying. So you might as well have a good time. Oh, yeah, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. Sheep go to heaven, boats go to hell. Boats go to hell? Yeah, sure, why not? Both sheep and boats, goats and boats, goats and boats, they rhyme. They both go to hell. go to the sunset strip i don't want to feel the emptiness old marquees with stupid band names i don't want to go to sunset strip i don't want to go to sunset strip i don't want to feel the emptiness old marquees with stupid band names i don't want to go to sunset strip doon, 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 doon. another dare i say goaded cake song among many Cake were Cal are California existentialists, is like how I like to think of it. Because, and I say a California existentialist because they, under, they employ the automobile as the pivotal metaphor for uh, capitalist modern social uh, reality, which is we are all moving together through place, spaces, but we are not uh, occupying the same space. We are instead locked into discrete prisons what uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the buffered self. And it's, this is how we negotiate with one another. And, uh, you know, when that's the situation, when you're not actually touching other people and, and making yourself vulnerable to them in your interactions with them, if you are in a zero-sum contest with them like you are on the road, then uh, Satan really is your motor. Like, no matter what your intentions are, you know, uh, your basic desire motor has been programmed to treat everybody else as an obstacle to your own enjoyment. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. This will be the last broadcast. This will be my last press conference. Not forever, probably, although I, who knows what the future holds, but it will be an extended break as uh, stuff occurs in my life. You may either know or not know about. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't, I like having a line. I know it's stupid, but it's necessary. Um, but I wanted to do a sequel to last week's episode, which I felt, I thought we were getting somewhere talking about, uh, the split of the bourgeois psyche, how it's uh, arrayed against itself, how it, when piloting a political system will pilot it towards the rocks in order to just, uh, cease the, the irreconcilable battle going on in the cycle, in the psyche of the middle class. But I wanted to, before I step aside for a second, get at something deeper, which is exactly what constitutes self-interest. I've talked about that a little bit before, but uh, specifically what, what constitutes our, uh, our understanding of pleasure and pain uh, and how they form, that forms our psyche. Because, uh, you know, it, modern society, capitalist society has often been, uh, described as operating by the pleasure principle. We're all self-interested individual economic agents seeking our self-interest in a marketplace. That is how you describe human uh, civilization now and how, if you are a ideologue of, of the current system, you look back in time and you say, actually, that's how we always acted. We were just fettered by these uh, superstitious and outdated social institutions. And then eventually we were able to uh, unveil ourselves. And 
we're still not fully free, but we're much freer than we were. And we need to push forward with more and more freedom for the individual to pursue its best interest because that self-interest mutually, uh, mutually pursued will bring about civilization. But while it builds civilization, it also destroys it for all the reasons I laid out last week because of what they, what the person wants in a advanced capitalist society is and anywhere in the social order is the destruction of themselves and the society they live in. That is the thing that actually powers capitalism, this, and this existential antagonism resonating through all of our social, political, and most importantly, technological institutions serves up this, uh, this extinguishment, this, uh, this self-destruct button being pressed. And it's because there is an idea of self-interest, the pleasure principle, that does actually extend throughout history. Like uh, the, the libertarian, uh, neoliberal type uh, economists will say, will are vindicated that, yeah, we've always been driven by some sort of pleasure principle. What changes, though, is what gives us pleasure. I think this is key to everything is that the social order, the, 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 the social subjectivity that we live under was forged in a pre-capitalist era when the like most viscerally felt sense of pleasure that one could pursue uh, could not allow for the sort of psychotically personal, uh, anti-social uh, edge to our pleasure pursuit. Things that we find pleasurable now would not have been pleasurable then, like in a, in that in the in the chemical sense, because if we drill down to it, this pleasure principle that guides our actions in the world and defines reality for us is what feels good to what what feels good to, to go towards and what feels bad to go against to avoid. Now that is partially what feels good literally because our brains do release chemicals when it has pleasant stimuli. Like it, 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 in that it's pleasant, it's defined as pleasant because it makes those chemicals emit, right? It provides a sensation that goes beyond logic and beyond reason and beyond uh, 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 empirical observation. And uh, it is instantaneous. It is a flood of chemicals released by an interaction with some sort of compound. And that does structure our understanding of pleasure and pain as we navigate our life, way towards life. Things that get that reaction to happen are good things. Food, water, sex. These are things that make that feel, make those things release. Uh, exertion towards, like, you know, uh, the, the engagement of the body through conscious action. But pleasure isn't just uh, to be found in those moments of interaction with a chemical. There's also the, the mind at rest, the mind unstimulated by outside chemicals, the mind purely reliant on the stimulation of senses. And what is pleasurable to that, uh, that state of consciousness? What releases the good chemicals the way that interaction with chemistry does? What, what kindles that? It is things that we would organize around the concept of love as a reflection of safety. We feel safe Therefore, we can feel, uh, we feel content. We feel the brain can release chemicals that make us feel like we can occupy our mind idly uh, without having to have some sort of thing telling, stimulating good feelings in our body. And that can only happen if we have people that we trust fully. As in, you have full confidence that they are enjoying that your company uh, more... Um, enough to want to keep you around and vice versa. And that creates this, this extends the notion of uh, pleasure outside of the body, not just to the uh, dead chemicals that we interact with, you know, through killing animals, through, uh, through harvesting crops, but our interaction with other people that are just purely uh, symbolic, that, are, that aren't actual interactions, that are symbolic interactions. But those symbolic interaction, interactions can generate their own signals in the brain 
and get the brain to release chemicals independent of what we're doing. It is, I am feeling good right now, and I will feel good in the uh, near future. That is the sense of uh, rooted pleasure. That is a context where the good chemicals can fill your body with a genuinely pleasant sensation. Even if you do not process it as a sensation, even if you process it as some sort of narrative, while you're having that narrative, you're also having these chemical reactions that imprint around these encounters and build continued extended relationships to other people. And so a pleasure principle is still pursued in every pre-capitalist social order, but it's one that is predicated upon the best interests of people in your vicinity. And over time, technology allows the vicinity to get bigger so that you're not just talking about kin networks, you're talking about more abstract concepts like the nation or, uh, you know, the, uh, the ethnicity, but eventually the race. Language creates this new understanding of this other that if we have meaningful political institutions that allow us to communicate with one another and, like, distribute power through those networks, then we can actually feel safe, feel at peace, but capitalism, but but the but the spike that's in this, as soon as you get a particularly advanced society, because it's this drive, everybody in this together to survive, that creates the most the early expressions of complex, uh, permanent uh, uh, class societies around agriculture and ritual. It's to make the time that we're spending together pleasurable, and ritual action, ritual movement actually chemically alters the brain by associating the performance of ritual ritual simulated acts with the same sense of purpose that you get while struggling even if it's unpleasant for others and this is the the radical distinction in in subjectivity that capitalism re represents when we talk about pleasure and pain we are literally talking about the sensations that we encounter chemically because we have defined our society only through value form. And the value form is the abstracted, pulled from time and space, pulled from context value of a society, fully uh, symbolized, and then used as a, as a way to compensate for that lack of safety that we feel. Because class society generates this anxiety because... We're all working for the same team, but we're not all on the same side. And so now suspicion and worry, the, 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 the beginning of social neuroses emerge out of these friction-filled encounters between people who are working on behalf of others for the best good of everyone. And this creates a cycle of alienation that pulls us away from our best interest because the only way we can compensate for the lack of the gap in our sense of pleasure as safety is to compensate with pleasure as experience, compensate as with pleasure as uh, chemical interaction. But that only in the moment distracts from the fundamental tension that the tension which leaves you in a position where repose does not bring the, the rooted sense of safety and comfort that powered every other social order we've ever had, now, even at our quietest, we only feel divided against ourselves because we live in a permanent state of social conflict, because we can only see each other as strangers in a zero-sum marketplace. And we can say all we want, oh, capitalism rises all boats, but every capitalist interaction involves the exploitation of surplus labor. And more importantly than anything, the, the uh, expropriation of time. This is a thing that uh, is very crucial to Marx's idea of exploitation that doesn't, I think, get talked about enough, which is that we are talking about your time on Earth, which is a finite length. And we are saying that you must 
for X amount of hours in a day. Exert your body. Work your body through space for someone else's benefit and at someone else's instruction, which means that all of the feelings that you're going to have during that time, they're going to be bad feelings. Working is going to feel bad. So that it is time you have spent in a social relation of inherent guilt for that, ex for that exploiting it because they know what they're doing. You know what you're doing. More than anything, you know how they feel about you or they feel at least about this experience, even if they don't necessarily connect it to you. Because it is time that defines our lives. I mean, that's very stupid to say, never mind. What I mean is time is what is the extra dimension, the fourth dimension in all of our understandings of social value that gets lost in the abstract discussion of it. Because there is no thing that is universally pleasurable or painful. There is no experience. There is no con thing consumed and interacted with that is inherently pleasurable or painful from the subjective experience of the person who is in that moment. Depending on why you are doing something, depending on what goal you are pursuing, any almost any experience can be felt, if not pleasurable in like the physical sense, meaningful in the sense that it aligns you in a deeper certainty that banishes the, the future and the past, which are really what lay on us and allow us to not experience the fucking present because the present has been bought. The present is the property of others. We try to buy it back on the marketplace, but by then it is dead. It has been pulled from its chronologically, temporally fixed position where you were in a place looking at another person and your body was flooding you with chemicals that were producing a deeply rooted sense experience because of this reason and this reason and this context. And we take those experiences and we turn them into symbolized reenactments, narrative reenactments of, of pleasurable encounter, pleasurable social life, and then we sell them back to us. We sell them to each other. And we become completely addicted to them because we do not know that there is another way to feel pleasure. Because we have been so cut off and severed from one another. And the hope we all have is that those mental patterns are not immutable. That as we willed ourselves subconsciously to build these relationships out of our unresolved tension, the unresolved dynamo of, of uh, social neuroticism that is powered by our alienated from position from ourselves and the fundamental contradiction of trying to be a human subject at war with a hu other human subjects, when co-identification and cooperation and existential union with others is the sine qua non of human existence, what is necessary for humans to fucking exist. That contradiction powers us through continued cyclical annihilations of our uh, social world and our subjectivity to be made, to be replaced by new ones. And, and, and this process will continue. There is an idea that it could continue to a final point wherein that sense of self is, that pre-modern sense of self that sense of self that extends beyond the self and that sense of literally chemical relationship between experience uh, and uh, uh, like our, our uh, bodies, like our literal chemically, chemically composed bodies. Uh, that can be changed too. Not all at once, not miraculously, but through a changing in our relationship to these stable forms, uh, we are going to, the ones of us who make it, are going to be forced to fundamentally revise our notions of who we trust, why, what we want out of experience, what we want out of a moment of life. Uh, and in so doing, we're going to explode sparks of, of uh, and kindlings of, of, of new uh, social formation in the rubble of the technological explosion that has occurred around us. Because I think there is a version of communism 
and before it liberalism that uh, replaced the uh, supernatural uh, apocalypse of Christianity, which was no longer viable in a higher, higher technology, higher scientific literacy society that, that emerged in the 19th century. Uh, you don't get rid of uh, uh, heaven by doing that. It's absurd. You secularize heaven. You make heaven a place on earth, the way that the Christians imagined would happen in the first place, and then you people it with your descendants. That is how you resolve this fundamental tension of we've killed God, one God and had to create another one. And we f f people it with our descendants, people who look like us in some fundamental way. Defined, of course, against all the other people who don't look like us. Now, cap communism imagines that we resolve that fundamental tension through class conflict, which leads to one class seizing control, the working class, of this amazing uh, technology, and then using it to uh, transcend this false dialectic and use the technology that we've accumulated to actually make heaven on earth, to just do it, to no longer make it a neurotic uh, uh, fantasy to displace our... Uh, uh, our schizophrenic identities. Uh, and I think liberals always imagined that you'd get to the same place. Space communism, where where capitalism and the need for money has been transcended, where humans can like pursue their total self-realization, which is what we're actually talking about here. How to create a society where people can move with a triumph of will through the world and assert their dominance over it. Not necessarily, under, under class regimes, that becomes dominating. But the idea is, in a post-capitalist regime where technology has facilitated like real human communication for the first time, everyone could move in a direction that both builds a healthy social uh, organism and gives everybody within it the ability to pursue a personal apotheosis. Capitalism has a similar uh, uh, trajectory, and it imagines that that process occurring through reforms, through nonviolent reforms over time. That's certainly what 20th century progressives thought, if you put a gun to their head. Now, that is the liberal left tradition that emerges out of the collapse of the social world of uh, feudalism. But of course, because this is one psyche, this is one uh, political subject emerging from the clashes of the culture, the, the, the classes of cultures and clashes of classes in the 19th century. There is another version of this which says that's impossible. To do that would be to annihilate myself, my sense of identity, my, my ego that is armored around this pursuit, this ritualized pursuit of domination because it's rewarded me, because it's felt good to do. And this is how you get left and right in a modern context. You get the elite first who are divided between those for whom ruling feels good and those for whom it feels bad, which is a subjective experience determined by their specific encounters with the same basic experience, but through the individualized lens of their personal experience, which is going to take all kinds of polarities and spin them around and basically orient you into two camps, which is always what ends up happening, the polarization around two camps. And then you have that happening in the working class, too, who are being exploited, who are having their time literally taken from them. Some of them become reactionary and want to blame someone below them. Others of them have say, hey, what about these people on top? And that all comes down to individual experience, again. Now, in the right, the right is those people who want to keep ruling. And they create, I, they create all kinds of ideologies around this. But the fundamental, the fundamental point is, is that when faced with the option of uh, letting go of their sense of domination and power, their specific ego orientation, they would rather die. They would, they would find in the fight for their victory, death preferable because it would, as I said, it would follow the pr pleasure principle. Submitting would be such a psychic trauma such an unconceivable psychic trauma that they would rather die in battle. This is the whole warrior culture that emerges in class societies is expressing alienation through this 
this uh, finely honed weapon of male hormones strapped to fundamentally uh, panic-stricken, uh, schizophrenic, ruling class minds. How do we sit with our fellow people and, and, and ex through ritual and through violence and through the hope that at some point these contradictions will resolve themselves in a spectacular annihilation? That's the, that's the right wing. Like, we could win, and by winning, ritually and violently cleanse our class enemies and the, uh, more importantly, the ethnic and national uh, broad stereotypes that we've laid on top of them. And that will also be a pleasurable pursuit because it will ac accord to our deeper understanding of others as separate from ourselves, which the progressive left does not feel. I think they have the deeper truth of it, which is the fundamental need to, res uh, to reconcile the human race rather than to divide it and exterminate part. Because my belief in the, uh, this psychology means even if your uh, society does do what you have uh, dreamed of doing, you will destroy yourself from within because you have not gotten rid of the fundamental psychological contradictions embedded in the persistence of a class society. And you can look to uh, World War II as a perfect example of this. And what a coincidence, leading up to and introducing uh, the next pod series I'm going to be doing. I'm already I'm going to record the last one tomorrow, and it'll come out next month to kind of give people a taste of me, even though I will be gone. Uh, the Spanish Civil War and World War II really show you how this uh, how this actually functions. Like the, the, when the there were the uh, nationalist Spain was often called the fascist side uh, in popular like liberal um, journalism, they called them fascists. And of course, on the left, they were overwhelmingly referred to only as the fascist enemy. Uh, and in, there were a lot of similarities between the social base of uh, nationalist Spain and the ruling powers of Germany and Italy. And you know, there, there was elements there, like the Falange was a self-conscious uh, fascist party. And it was, once the rising started, it became the biggest political party in Spain or in nationalist Spain, before being subsumed by the by Franco. And there were people um, in that coalition who, once the war was won and World War II began, we're very keen on getting Franco to join the Axis powers and declare war on the West, invade Gibraltar to cut off the British from the Mediterranean, which was really what um, Hitler wanted most. And they had given, the Germans and the Italians had given so much aid to Franco, and most of it on credit. And yes, the uh, the Germans got a big chunk of the, of the Spanish mining uh, industry, but they also laid out a ton of money. And the Italians got basically nothing back from their uh, input because, you know, they didn't have the leverage. And then fucking Franco just strings them along, makes impossible demands to join the Axis. Like, hey, I would like all of the French uh, colonies in North Africa, even though Vichy France was a German ally. I also want control of the Western Mediterranean, which the Italians were assuming they would have. And, he, and Hitler says no. And then finally, when Hitler is like really very keen to get him on the side, like, oh, this isn't going so well. We might need this much more than we thought we would. Uh, Franco's just like, new phone, who dis? And then uh, uh, in compensation, he sends the Blue Division, the Division Azul, which is made up of the most enthusiastic fascists who really do want to push forward a social revolution and like become part of this world war for civilization as they saw it. And Franco was like, that's nice, boys. That's nice. Why don't you go off and play on the Eastern Front? Go hang out in Leningrad. Have fun there. And he sacked his brother-in-law, who was like the big phalangist in the, in the cabinet. And Franco sat out World War II. And then as a result, there was no uh, turn to 
wipe him out after the war ended, which a lot of the Spanish Republicans thought was going to happen. They thought, oh, the Allies are going to beat France and Italy, Germany and Italy, and then they're going to take out Franco because he's one of the on their side. But he hadn't fought, so there was no need to fight him, and he was integrated into the post-war order very, very pretty, pretty seamlessly. Like there was some reluctance to let Franco's Spain join some European-wide organizations, but eventually they were just fully brought in. And what happened? The apocalypse that guys like Hitler saw, which was not necessarily the physical destruction of Germany, but like the cultural destruction of what they thought Germany was or what re represented psychically, uh, was too much to bear, which is why they fought to the end and all des destroyed themselves. Franco didn't really care if capitalism came to Spain uh, as long as they kept out, you know, the uh, real culturally uh, decadent elements, you know, the Freemasons and the, the liberals and the socialists. If they kept those guys out, they could just have a nice little uh, uh, syndicalist state or corporatist state, rather, where the government's the, the military is in charge of the government. There's minimal foreign trade so that the economy can be self-sustaining, and we can like have a little uh, social uh, base here, based on Catholicism imposed at gunpoint. Mandatory, basically socially mandatory church attendance, uh, mandatory religious schooling, the church in charge of the, of the uh, entire cultural world and life. We'll, we'll settle for that. We'll settle for Catholic cultural hegemony. And they were able, to, they did that for like a, a, a 15 years, they, they, they rebuilt slowly after World War II. And then by the mid-50s, though, they were like falling way behind the rest of Western Europe developmentally. And that became a big danger to their continued existence. What if everybody leaves? We can't make them stay. And so they did a bunch of reforms. The white Freemasons of Opus Dei reformed the, the Franco's economy to allow foreign capital in. And with it, foreign tourists let Spain, Spanish people go outside of Spain to make money in other countries. And what happened? And where are we now? All the things that those guys fought and died for are gone. Now, if you're Franco, that's a fine... He probably wouldn't care that much. But for a guy like Hitler, it was inconceivable. And why? I think a lot of it boils down to the, the Nazis in general, not necessarily Franco, because Franco was a veteran of the, of the Moroccan Rift Wars, but like the, the generation that drove Europe into self-destruction in the fascist countries, had experienced World War I. And so by the big crisis, they were ready to destroy everything due to the collective trauma, I hate to use the word, inflicted by that experience. Spain opted out of World War I. In fact, World War I was when the modern Spanish economy burst into existence. Before that, it's struggling along, limping behind, but then because they didn't fight in the war, they become suppliers for everybody, and they start doing insta import substitution, and they have a big economic boom and a big baby boom to go with it. And that baby boom matures at the exact same time that the Depression takes the bottom out of the Spanish economy. So they fight their world war, but it's a civil war, after which you have a generation of leaders who are guys like, their equivalent in Germany would not be Hitler, it would be Hindenburg. Guys who had not been in trenches getting gassed, but guys who were behind the lines looking at maps. And they have no interest in annihilating the world. They're fine. They'll be able to make a future that's that's safe for their uh, understanding of uh, tradition because it's so much tied to the perpetuation of their wealth. Only at the grassroots of like real deprivation, like the um, like the peasants of uh, Navarre, who make up the uh, spearhead of the small holding, uh, like, the militia man, the, the minute man portion of the Spanish army is made up of these farmers from Galicia, but mainly from Navarre. I mean, they're, they're everywhere that there are small farmers. They, a lot of them join the Nationalist Army, but in, in no place do they join in such huge numbers as in Navarre, which is a Basque peripheral province in the Pyrenees in northeastern Spain. And these guys live in an area where it's it's close enough to France, which is dominated by medium-sized farmers who are able to 
become relatively prosperous farming land with their families and therefore not having an experience of alienated labor either way. The family is working. The family is, is, is it's hard. It's not fun all the time, but there is always a reason to do it that is the family's best interest. And the, and the family decides collectively, sure, the dad orders and the kids are annoyed by it, but they're also kids, so it doesn't bother them as much. There is a rough co uh, consensus for meaning that is generated in these farming community, farming households that allows them to view like the Spanish feudal order as like the guarantor of their best interest. And so they fought for it. Because farming is hard. Why You want to go fucking shoot somebody for how hard it is. But because you're not hiring anybody and you're not being hired out, because you can afford to stay on a, a self-sustaining piece of land, you have opted out of capitalist social relations, the alienation of capitalist social relations, which is what, what Europeans were fleeing the entire 17th, 18th, and 19th century. No thanks. I would rather not have that experience. Let's see what America has to, in store. And a lot of them were able to get enough land to do that. But eventually it fills up and, and, and that, that subjectivity gets everybody. But it gets it slowly. Like the Roquetes got bought off their land. Their kids are probably all now uh, uh, like progressive or like groipers. Either way, they're alienated in a way that the their ancestors never were and that they never would have wanted to allow. Like people like people point out when talking about you know trying to do anarchism. Uh, Like why can't people work on farms and it's it's not it's it's sustainable culturally it's sustainable socially it doesn't require someone in the relationship to be consistently piling up experience points to use and distract themselves from how uh, exploitative their relationships are like the plantation owner he can't just sit there and and and, and stare at the slaves working in the fields no matter how much he thinks he's better than them. The very fact that at any moment they could kill him. Forget about whether he thinks they're people. The fact that at any moment there could be a knock at the door, he could open it, and there'd be a guy with a fucking machete who'd split his fucking wig means that they can't just sit in a rocking chair. That thought would eventually destroy their brain. And the fear of slave uprising was the neuroses of the Southern planter class. It's how their neuroses expressed itself. And so what they did was they drank mint juleps, they got fine furniture, they sent away for fancy European books. They 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 did all they did they created all these pretensions of civilization in order to distract and assuage that fundamental inability to be still, to be fixed, and to feel safe, which is the basis, the building block of all of our understandings of good and evil, right and wrong. The thing that transcends culture, because, I mean, I think the there is a resolution to the, the question of, like, cultural relativism, and it is this, that no matter what, how cultures express social values, the things that those are based on fundamentally is, how do I get to this situation? Now, those answers are warped and determined by the class relationships that dominate their superstructure and, and turned into the reverse, how to extinguish this. How to get rid of this feeling completely so that we're never haunted by it. How can we annihilate this sensation forever? Which is, of course, how to annihilate sensation, how to kill ourselves. But the farming that these people imagine is sustainable and a, a, a situation where you can sustain it and you can harvest enough so that everybody who harvests it is uh, able to share in not just like the amount of work being done, but also uh, a democratic say over how the work is done. Because that is how you can feel good doing anything, is if you chose to do it. The way that your brain can be chemically altering your experience to tell you that any experience, including hard physical labor, feels good even if it feels a little bad in some ways is that you want to do it 
why sports are more fun than exercise. But there's a problem. The second law of thermodynamics kicks in. Latency in communication uh, lines kicks in. The depletion of soil kicks in. The, 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 the black swan uh, uh, random chance kicks in. Chaos theory kicks in. Which means that at a certain point, these uh, become unsustainable. We know where that point is. It's about the size of the family. The family can farm in a state that approximates the 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 pre uh, class world, pre agricultural idol of the hunter gatherers as we understand them or imagine them to be, where people did what they wanted to do, where there wasn't a ritualized extraction of time from one person at the expense of another, or uh, that someone's time was taken from them in the form of being told to do something by someone else. Now, as I said, kids on farms don't feel great about it. They think it sucks, but they also understand why they're doing it. They trust their, they should, I mean, in a harmonious, we're assuming here that we have like functional social relationships, which of course, over time are made unfunctional by the vagaries of life by that chaos theory interrupting everything. Even that stable point will eventually rupture because of fucking entropy. So this is why the only solution to the problem of, well, how can we get there and not give up our, our, our complex ordered social society, society and allow for the degree of like abstract symbol exchange, civilization as we imagine it. How do we do that? We cannot do it on a basis of family farm. The the efficiency is not sufficient. Collectivization of agriculture and technological uh, in, uh, intensification of agriculture is necessary. But the only way that you can technologically intensify agriculture is if you maximize exploitation. You have to start telling people to work longer for less if you want to accumulate the capital to invest in mechanization. Now you can imagine, as the Spanish anarchists did, since we all know that the family farm is going to be unstable. I mean, in places like Navarre, it was still it was relatively stable because of relatively stable uh, agricultural conditions, but it was also limited by those conditions. Um, the Carlists kept losing wars in the 19th century because they just didn't have the numbers. But the anarchists thought the, the, the because the they, they the anarchists recognized that the family was insufficient. The family could not collectively intensify uh, production absent uh, uh, exploitation sufficiently to start mechanizing the process. The only thing that could do that is a broader co uh, coordination beyond the family farm into larger village size social organisms and that was their dream that was their model for the so the the social life of anarchism was based on the peasant pueblo everybody has mutual obligations to one another everybody collaborates on when farming should occur who should do what how long and by everybody getting a voice and everyone trusting one another you create a situation where you are working hard doing work that is unpleasant in some respects but you are doing it in a context of full uh, freedom. You are choosing to work. And that was the dream of Spanish anarchism. Uh, it, of course, crashed against the rocks of reality, which were, hey, while you guys are trying to re-stitch together the present Pueblo, everybody else in Europe and a large percentage of... Uh, like an increasing percentage of countries around the world are rushing headlong into a depersonalizing uh, regime of urban uh, industrial production that implies and in fact requires as its starting point exploitation as the social relationship.
Yes, yeah, somebody says the time I'm describing is free not to care what the thing means. As in free not, you don't actually care uh, what you're doing or why. It is a, it, Life is a game because any answer is good because you are safe. And the more we feel that in our lives, the more our lives have a, uh, a architecture of joy that can like give us an actual like skeleton and, and a sense of self that can persist even as we as we die. Like as we begin to look more and more backward because there's less and less in front of us. That's inevitable for everybody who gets older. It's just a fact. And the fact that we can't look forward makes us start looking backward. And I really think that is how our brains interpret Alzheimer's. The brain is going crazy trying to keep up giving you pleasure feelings while you are getting closer to death without like letting you acknowledge, oh yeah, I'm getting closer to death. And so your brain just fills you with a highlight reel of the, the fun times you've had. The, the moments that are uh, connected to a specific experience. Like, and that is why people with Alzheimer's often get very, very floridly descriptive of very, detail, very minute details of things that happened uh, decades ago. Uh, Joe Biden, for me, the question of whether he was uh, demented or not was answered when he get, did the corn pop story. And it wasn't even necessarily the corn pop story. It was the specific moment when he describes how the kids in the pool would put their hands on his leg and run them over his leg, and then the hair would stand up and like catch the water in the sun. That is a like an experience that for him, his brain was fully chemically devoted to making him feel like he was safe, like he was good, like life was in front of him, like he would get everything he ever wanted. And so that's what his brain is giving him as it's winking out because there is nothing in front for that continued so idea of the self. There is another, there is something going on. There is, I think, an eternal upward spiral, but that experience cannot be connected to yours because it is not fixed to those. It's not in this world. It's in a future world. I think it's the same spirit. And I think that this retroactive remembering i think over time becomes more and more intense and extends beyond the self into a full like moment instantaneous reunion with every past version of ourselves where all of the things that uh separated our experience the specific fixed elements the symbolic representations of the different historical eras and attendant identities and senses of self uh that are arrayed one or another in one or another corkscrew fashions are sort of burned away, and all there is is the is the single experience of of existing. But to believe that, you have to socially reinscribe trust in others. You have to socially reinscribe uh, connection to other people. You have to socially, ritually, collectively, repeatedly socialize your brain, giving off chemicals that make you feel safe, which can only happen in the presence of others, because if you're by yourself, there is always a question because our senses cannot be trusted. We all know that the fucking cart, they cart open this can of worms five, 400 years ago with the fucking evil demon in the head in the jar. This is the thing we all know is that our senses have no basis beyond their continued deliverance of us, of good feelings of, of, of a, if not good feelings in the moment, a map for pursuing good feelings a heuristic for going from one good feeling to the next. Rats in a maze. And that means as we approach death, as we are leached of these moments, as more and more of our time is spent alone and in doubt, and even our pleasures are at the expense of other people in a way that's conscious in our minds when we're having them and have to be kind of ignored in the moment, but then come rushing back with the clarity of, of uh, hindsight. We become so terrified of, of, of re-encountering our, our, our uh, experiences in life, our decisions, without the lens of, well, it felt good in the moment. Like at every point, it felt good in the moment is the ultimate arbiter and the ultimate determiner, not just of what's right and wrong, but what reality is. But when you look back through time and you're encountering these things, 
stripped of the specific array of pleasures, the smells, the tastes, the feelings, the 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 the, the, the movement of, of of serotonin and dopamine through your bloodstream, the specific architecture of that ecstasy. Once that's gone, all that's left is your selfish decision to act like somebody else didn't matter and wasn't real. And then you have to relive it from the other side. That's what we're terrified of. That is karmic retribution, and that is what our mind will subconsciously give us. Pass that veil. And the reason I'm not scared of that is because the way I conceive it, it is not the closing down of a the, the turning off of lights, as as t Tony Soprano feared. It's the turning on of all lights. It is in a moment a a a wreck connection that makes you realize all the bad things you did and makes you realize all the mistakes you made. But at the very same moment, teaches you the greater lesson that it it's okay, and that it doesn't really matter because the real implication of us all being the same is that. We cannot harm one another. We can only struggle in, in a mutual non-recognition and beat out a pattern that forms the process, the, the map of our consciousness coming into existence. Uh, but that, at the end, holds no more weight than a dream. And that, that means that experience of nothing is actually the experience of everything. And that cannot be bad. It cannot feel bad. It cannot feel scary. It cannot hurt. Because it is that feeling that all of our understandings of hurt, bad, are annihilated by. Because it is only in ignorance that we build those things. And re uh, a, 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 uh, coming back to knowledge frees us of the guilt, but keeps our experiences well alive as part of the process. Uh, every decision we make, every bad and good one, builds this tower that we all live at different points on. And so there's no more judging those decisions than there is judging the blocks of uh, stone uh, in a castle. Now, on the other side of that is more pain, is more suffering. And a lot of it is going to be because of what we did while we were in this life. But it's going to be experienced by somebody else. There's no reason to be scared of it. When we re-encounter that experience, it will be from that same point of total awareness that you are at the end of your life, which means that the, the actual uh, experience of the pain itself emotional, physical, uh, is drained. And we get to, in those moments, write our own uh, minds. Our brains are going to keep giving out dopamine and serotonin uh, in that, the quantum realm for as long as it takes to reconcile us to our decisions and our identities and through the, to the, the fact that we are merely God's taste buds. And that we exist as this necessary component that must circulate uh, ignorantly through time and space to build the very thing that uh, gives it gives this meaning by retrospectively re-engaging with it. Like people say, why do you think that uh, uh, everything comes into awareness at some point? Uh, it seems like a uh, it's an unsupported thesis, but for me, it comes down to the fact that consciousness, as we understand it, which gives us our sense of good and bad, which gives us our universe, which gives us everything, uh, is retrospective. It's not a thing happening to a body. It is a a body creating a post facto narrative of something that has already occurred, and that means that there is we're writing this as we're doing it. We encounter our mistakes in the future, and then we uh, rectify them. And that drives us through time, but not just through the limited time span of our individual lives, but through the endless uh, reconfiguring variation of, of particles that we are made up of. I hope this isn't too uh, hippy-dippy bullshitty, but uh, to me, it, it's, it's true. 
because getting back to chemistry, getting back to the body, and getting out of all the fucking philosophical, theological bullshit. Our brains release chemicals to our body. Our brain releases a chemical that gives us feelings. Our brain chooses to do that. It does it when it is it, it responds to things, but it it does a it is co constituated of two things, of the encounter with the world through chemicals, and then with the distribution of brain chemistry to the body to signal what that just ha what just happened and give it meaning. And because of the difference in time between when something happens and when we are building our narrative of it, that, that gap that it's like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, but from a quantum perspective, it is basically eternity. It's where they go in the jaunt if they don't get knocked out beforehand. That's where all of our understandings of the universe are generated from, not from the actual experience, but from that fractionally delayed narrative of it. But we act from the narrative, which means we supersede and overrule the uh, the objective chain reaction of chemistry that like moves things through our body. And our, we start deploying the feel-good and feel-bad chemicals to things that don't necessarily actually make our body more or less injured or pleasured. So coming into awareness is coming into acceptance of like what your body is telling you and then moving towards non-destructive feel-good chemistry in your brain. You, you're reprogramming the map. The you are you are you are redefining what the cheese is in the map, and all that really is is allowing yourself to interact with the world non-reactively. I hate to use the again. This is all turning into hippie bullshit. No one should listen to me. These points have been made a million times. I'm not special. I'm just in front of a camera. I was just born at a time when I assumed everybody needed to know my fucking opinion about something as if it fucking mattered. Ugh. I realize it's just embarrassing to even say this stuff, but going with the flow. Allowing that uh, reactive uh, assumption, the flinch, to work itself out and to allow you to look around and be like, oh, this isn't actually giving me the uh, response I thought it was. I don't have to clench against this. Uh, maybe I don't have to have the same mental response to it. Uh, I mean, I understand that what I'm fundamentally doing is is I'm trying to... Uh, I'm exercising... I am... Conducting an experience, an exercise in large animal euthanasia. Uh, I am euthanizing my own sense of self and and the sense of self of those around me. Uh, to to grip with the fact that like what we think we can control is already occurred, and all we can do is respond to it. And that means we have to let down our alerts, our shields. Not reinforce them. Our, our 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 instinct is to reinforce the shields. Oh shit! We can't control what's happening. Something's coming. Batten down the hatches. But I would say the way to to think about it is, not only has the thing already happened, but the shield has already been broken. So then the question is: Are you going to t spend the time between now and whatever you're afraid of? Bracing against it, and therefore spending all of the time between now and the impact arrayed against yourself and against the people around you, therefore robbed of the ability to have that genuine sense of feeling good and still that I talked about, meaning that you're going to be more and more frantically hurting yourself in the long term to distract yourself in the short term, and ensuring that when you finally do collide with reality, oh, I'm actually authoring something much more awful than I was even afraid of. 
if you accept that the shields have already failed, then the, you can just try to find that center and not bunch yourself around your fear of the unknown, but accept that the worst thing you could think of has happened. And here's the thing. The more you accept that the worst thing you can think of has happened, the less likely that is to actually occur. Because you can engage with the world around you, not through your neurotic screen that's going to push you towards self-destruction, but through a... a, a uh, a clear pain that allows you to see clearly other people, see into other eyes clearly, and to gain a sense of self that pulls you away from the real fear, which is not that an X is going to happen, but that X is going to happen to me as I constituate myself now. And the thing is, is if a bad thing happens to me as I constituate myself now, I will be so horrified by the loss of future pleasure, one way or the other, However minutely or grandly we imagine that, from death to, oh no, I'm not going to be able to eat meat as much, is going to drive us into annihil uh, annihilation. But the more we offload the self, the more we can take those changes without even knowing we are, without even we knowing we're making a choice. We are subconsciously pivoting to a new magnetic north. Now, of course, I say this to keep myself where I am. Like, I'm talking about this, and guess what? Talking about this stuff, guess what well, Guess what? The chemicals I get? Oh, I get the good, baby. I get the good chemicals. I get the good chemicals that go through me. Oh, yeah. And because people respond and say, I think this is good and it's helping me, I get to tell myself, okay, this is better than other things I could be doing to feel good that never actually feel as good. Even though I'm... Changing my chemistry, what the hell? I am left with the necessity of falling onto my faith in my senses, which is all we finally have. And my senses tell me that the deepest satisfaction comes from that. And that as such, if the worst thing I, I imagine can happen, which for me personally is some sort of physical betrayal of my body, because it already happened once. I had a uh, absolutely out of nowhere uh, and, and, and honestly medically improbable thing happen to me in my late high school years that completely just like threw me off of any kind of course of adulthood and came out of nowhere. Uh, and uh, I believe at one point they said that it's something so rare that there's like a single digit number of times, or no, a hundred or so. I think there are a hundred or so reported cases for like the specific thing that happened to me. And so I've been spending my entire life since then waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that has ripped me out of my life for longer than I like thinking about and has made me treat other people very badly in a way that at the time didn't feel that bad because I was hurting too. And all I, I feel differently now and I feel... I feel, but I also still feel like a lot of, I still have like experiences. I still remember to think about my past and I still look at the future and it's scary. The future is scary. No matter how you can strip neuroses from it and try to be as objective as possible. And there's still something to be scared of coming around the bend. Like the rest, every way everyone responds to the world tells you that like everybody knows something that we can't say and you can't even, uh, Accept ourselves. But when I say, well, what do I do with that knowledge? Do I freak out about it and try to stop it? Which in my case means like frantically going to the doctor, trying to get like some tests and find out like what exactly is wrong with me. Or if you don't feel that way, a lot of people, the desire to get a gun and go to the woods is the same thing. The desire to like have some final confrontation is part of that same desire to avoid what you're really scared of. Which is not death necessarily, but vulnerability. Because I don't think we know what exactly is going to happen. Yes, I think it has occurred in like a metaphysical, metaphysical sense already. But as I said, that gap is essentially eternity. So we cannot know. We cannot. We have to accept that in the face of the enormity of that gap 
between sense and perception, we have to accept our own finitude. So we don't know what it's going to look like. So we have to ask ourselves, who, how can we take the time we have as we are before we become someone we don't recognize, which is happening every minute anyway, but like not always in a direction that we can predict. How can I spend the time before that happens building a base to move forward from one way or the other in this world or the next? And that's what I'm trying to build. It is, it's what Heidegger talks about, you know, like he really did identify like the central problem of philosophy is that we're talking about uh, structures and abstracts, but what we really are trying to get at is how do we make it so we feel that way? How do we make life so that our moments are composed of those fully embodied senses where our brain is being chemically told that everything we are doing is right? In any sense of right, getting me a long-term goal, getting me a short-term goal, keeping me in the zone of safety and protection. See, I can't, and, and, and he his answer to that, the right-wing answer to that, the the uh, reactionary answer to that, which comes from that portion, remember, it's always headquartered at the ruling class because that is who makes uh, like articulatable social concepts. We're all lo looking for yes and no. We're all looking for pleasure and pain and how to get one and avoid the other. But only some of us are attain a position where we can like dictate the structures, actually build the the the, the maze, and uh, like that is split into once again temporality. The, the reactionary who is closest to the experience, and uh, the reactionary uh, ruling class is those who are closest to the experience. Like uh, the reason that slaveholders who had to sleep with restive slaves just like a, a hundred yards outside their bedroom, that their, their sense of the self is this bo guarded, bounded sense of self. In the, in the abstracted land of uh, merchant commerce, where you can pretend that capitalism isn't about exploitation, they maintained this, uh, honestly, fraudulent and uh, indulgent sense of, oh, yes, everyone is our brother. We're progressive now, while still just c carrying out exploitation, expropriation, and immiseration of those who they would otherwise claim are some way equal to them. And that is why the Heideggerian solution is oh, uh, race, and, uh, race and nation, taking the part of that earlier sense of family and tribe. So that you can do something, and it doesn't matter what happens. You don't have to be stricken by the fucking abstract neurotic, neurotic question of, oh no, what if it hap What if it, we fail? What if this doesn't work? What if our society is destroyed? What if I personally die? So what? You're going into battle. Death is glorious in battle, and that is what fascism was, and that's what separated it from something like Franco Spain. Like so yeah, somebody says, "Can I predict the next thirty years?" I have a, I have a, I have a, a, a throb in my temple lately that they tell me is nothing, and I've got good uh, results. I, I, I have degenerating discs in my spine right here, so I'm getting some sort of uh, like pinch that is sending signals God knows where. And the way that I feel those, the way that my body tells me, the only way, the only body I have. The one I can't share with anyone, the one I can't like say, hey, is this really what it, I think it feels like or not? That body is now having sensations and created by that and the fact that I'm just breaking down and getting old. And one of the things I feel is on and off this like little throb in my thing. And I'm like, is that just going to burst someday? So my predictions about the end of the world, or the, I said the end of the world, about the future transformation of the world are going to be driven not by any objective understanding of the of the evidence. It's going to come down to that feeling in my temple. This little thing. This little, it feels like a thumb is sort of pressing right here. That's what's going to make my uh, predictions, not any grounded understanding of the world. I have to 
get out of my head to have those feelings. I have to engage. Like right now I'm engaging in sort of the flow state of thought while things sort of come out of me. But, you know, what about when I am in repose? So like what I am doing is trying to be like, I, I spent years trying to tell myself that all the weird feelings in my body weren't really what I thought they were. When really I secretly wanted them to be so that I could just end it and not have to be continue living in the in the uh, matrix, the hopeless matrix of, of irreconcilable problems that made up my psyche. The, 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 the knot of, uh, of trauma that, that, that refused to let me move forward. I would rather, have, I mean, it was what I was afraid of, but it's actually what I was hoping for. Uh, but I would be able to distract my mind by saying, oh, it's not really happening. And the only way that I've been able to overcome the worst things that I associate with uh, that uh, that part of, like, that time in my life, which is when I would get angry. I mean, I never, I was never violent with anyone. I never, I, I would, I, I was always worried about raising my voice. So I never really even yelled outside of the show. Like, and that was sort of for effect. But a lot of it was me just feeling like I can finally let go of something that otherwise I kind of kept on a kettle. I would have road rage sometimes. But mostly it was just like a seething anger. And I don't feel that anymore. And like, all of my attempts to interrogate my position and understand what I'm supposed to be doing with my time I have left come down to the fact that the situation I'm in now is one where I am not angry all the time. I still have anxiety. I still have weird feelings in my body. And the fact that I don't even discount them anymore, I just accept, okay, yeah, that could be what you think it is. And that means I'm still not at peace all the time, but more so so that I don't have this erupting uh, like magma thing. And I think that is a big explanation for why exactly we are where we are culturally, is that everybody is sitting on this fucking volcano of frustration that is being directed at each other. It's being generated by our own contradictions that we cannot face, and so we're just projecting it out onto everyone else. Uh. So yeah, like I understand that what I'm basically doing here is a therapy where I get paid. I don't think you should really, if people want to understand like, what what is the difference between like entertainment, but in the in the classical technological like high modernist era and what it is in the tech in the techno twentieth century the the panopticon twenty first century, is that uh, we've gotten to a point now where like therapy is entertainment, because we're so messed up, and so cut off one one another that we cannot lo uh, rely on each other to do the therapeutic work of talking things out. And most of us can't afford to do it with a professional. There are people out there with no anxieties or struggles. Uh, I don't think you can say no, because the thing you have to remember is that this is not a uh, stable base. Second law of thermodynamics, entropy in the system is always pulling us, no matter how stable we are, just like those carless village uh, idols in the Pyrenees, is always pulling us away. It could be at a very, very slow pace that isn't recognizable to the self or to others, but it is still there. What And our degree of that deterioration refers to our degree of, uh, of neuroses, our degree of uh, schizophrenic... Uh, like ideation and our refusal to the level at which we refuse to acknowledge like uh, the basis for our pleasure seeking and like the degree to which we are able to extract and like deactivate the death element of that, the seeking, the, the suicidal element of it. I think the way to stop being angry all the time is to, Try it. It's very cheesy to say, but like it all, a lot of it comes down to just, oh God, this is so embarrassing. I just, it's, David Foster Wallace talked about this a lot. It's very frustrating to try to do the work of like dissecting the, the modern mind and, and like our places in it 
because as soon as you get out of analysis mode and into uh, uh, like suggested things to do because of that, you are left. The only things that like can actually mean anything are cliches, are the most obvious, dumbass, meaningless things that people say to each other in like AA. You know, the power of now or whatever the fuck. You're left with that because the answers to these questions are individual. It is it is our responsibility to just be open to the possibility of them. That's all we can ask in the moment to moment because the specific encounter that's going to shape your future is going to be a specific encounter. Unless you're an actual precog, you cannot tell somebody what specific time they have to keep their eyes open. So you might as well keep your eyes open the whole time. Oh, okay. So I hope I, all right. I think that's good. This is uh, me. This is my last one. As I said, for a while, I, I might, I, I think I'll probably do these some more. We'll see, but who knows? Uh, I'll, maybe I'll keep unwinding so that this feeling gets better rather than worse. Uh, maybe I will, uh, find that Things were actually worse than I thought they were in some way that I'm suppressing, like bodily, and that, nope, sorry, you actually were just, like, talking yourself out of, uh, like, a, 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 a very near-term encounter with a, a physical uh, apotheosis. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's why I won't make predictions. All I can say is uh, I... I See you on the other side one way or the other. <laughs> Peace.